Uh, I've got a lot to say. I'm just going to crack on. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start this story about uh, 2012. Start off as a registrar. Uh, surgery. Loved everything. Loved the operating. Loved the patients. But also had caught the bug for research doing an MD a couple of years previous to that. And um, looked at Envy to a degree with my, uh, to my English counterparts, who there had the Professor of Vascular Surgery as their consultant and was doing 50-50 academic and clinical time, which you just, uh, you just don't get that in Wales, or you didn't have that in Wales, and you're certainly not within the sphere of vascular surgery. And I want to share, you, share with you a story about amputation research, okay? Now, we do lots of things in vascular surgery, but an amputation is generally seen as a failure. We fail to save the leg. It's not technically difficult to do, okay? It, there's no industry interest. It's not sexy. And so probably as a result of that, amputation surgery is done pretty similar to how it was done about 30 years ago. Nothing's really changed because nobody's done the studies in it. And I'm going to share my story in terms of how this little nugget of interest has grown into, um, into the sort of the the, the piece of work that it is. And, and I think I'll say that it's important, looking retrospectively anyway, the two key things that happened is I found a seed, okay, a research, an idea, a concept within research that I thought needed to be looked at and that I was passionate about. And I thought it filled a gap that wasn't currently being uh, sort of researched and also found a mentor who actually is also a friend, I'm glad to say. <clears throat> Um, a few sort of buzzwords about things you need as a researcher. I'm going to highlight the tenacity and enthusiasm. You've got to have a fire in your belly. You've got to have some passion to say, no, I want to do this and see it through. Okay, And that's critical. And you can't teach that. You can't train that. But, you know, we are uh, all here probably because we've got that fire in the belly. Flexibility is important as well. I'm going to share with you a success story, but what I'm not going to tell you is the 101 other ideas that I had. And I was like, look at that. That's going to be amazing. That's going to be really interesting until you read the research done in the 1980s. Oh, it's already been done about 40 years ago. So have some flexibility when you're looking for that key thing that you're going to do and work on. So what I'm going to share with you about is about placement. And it's a study looking at a nerve catheter that's placed at the time of amputation surgery. So you do the amputation, you find the nerve, and typically you would just cut the nerve, and there you go. But you can put a little catheter next to it, put some local anesthetic through the catheter for five days, and it can impact pain after amputation surgery. So I'm going to start off with, or tell you a bit about how placement developed. So I went to Swansea in 2014 and saw for the first time a nerve catheter put, being put in. I thought, why has nobody told me about this before? I've seen and done loads of amputations. Why have we not done this before? So I went to my colleague, friend, mentor, Chris Twine, said, let's have a look at this. So we did a systematic review together, meta-analysis, and published it. Absolutely delighted. We also did some other work. We did a retrospective review looking at patients with and without the catheter, how much pain they had. We did a survey, spoke to some patients, and I'll come on to that in my next slide. And I also contacted a load of charities, and one of them got back to me. That was Douglas Badders Foundation. They gave me £500. Now, that's top and tape in terms of the research world, but what it demonstrated was that a charity thought it was important enough to put at least a few quid down on this as a concept. Um, now, I put all that together and tried to take it to the next step. But again, just because you don't do that doesn't mean it's a failure. I'm a, I'm a bad one at, at not celebrating success. Sometimes a good meta-analysis and a good paper, that is success. And okay, it doesn't lead to big grants or big funding or whatever. If it improves the literature, it's still a success. But my next step was to look and find a formal group of people who have the knowledge, skills, and aptitude to be able to take this idea and grow it into a grant proposal. And I went to the Centre for Trials Research. And I put a blue line there as if you just walk over to them. And, and, and it was a bit more <coughs> involved than that. I think looking back, the advice I give to people for when they're doing these kind of things, you've got to sell yourself like a Dragon's Den style thing. You've got to go there and you've got to pitch your idea because they've got to get that same um, uh, fire in the belly that you have. They've got to get understand that. Well, uh, the CTO were invaluable, and one of their suggestions was don't go for the big grant straight up front. Rather, go for a smaller feasibility. So we developed uh, a 50-patient feasibility. 
half of them have a nerve catheter, half of them don't, and we ask about pain. And we applied to Healthcare Research Wales and were successful in getting the RFPBB. So we did a 50 patient feasibility, this was about six years ago. Massive step forward, huge amount to learn. Well, there's a bit of a hiatus as I did a fellowship and got a consultant post, but got back, back on the bandwagon of placement and put in a grant for an NAHR HTA, uh, which was awarded in 22, and then we started working on it in 23. I said I'd talk briefly about patients. This is me with Dave Cox. He's a bilateral amputee. One amputation with a nerve catheter, one without. He supported us right from the start of the study. He's fantastic. Uh, we've also got Sean, who I don't know if I saw in the audience from last session, but she, her father had an amputation. She's been fantastic as well. And we're just about to go into um, BBC Radio Wales to talk about our feasibility results. I think I'm happier than he is, but he was happy on the day, just to say. <coughs> Challenges. This is grant applications. Flipping heck. Right, these are the headings for a stage 2 HTA application. Ferocious, right? And if you think that's not quite enough, you also have to do a stage one. And if it's also not enough, you've got eight weeks to do it, okay? So I think I've only got one of these in me every two or three years. They're, they really are ferocious. And one of the things which I uh, haven't shared is that in between those, before, as I was applying for this, before that, I got the um, Healthcare Research Wales NHS Research Time Award. And being afforded time to be able to do this kind of research is imperative. I'll put my hand up and say I did an awful lot of evenings and weekends work as a registrar. That's sort of how I pushed it through. That's not sustainable in the long run. You've got to carve out dedicated time within your job plan to pursue the things that you want to pursue uh, if it's going to be sustainable in the long run. So this is my last slide, just some finishing with some reflections and advice. I haven't really talked about the idea of dare to dream, but do, you know? dare to dream, think big, think where do I want to be in 10 or 20 years. And some people actually think where they want to be and then reverse engineer their way back. I, I wasn't, I didn't do anything like that. I'm just enthusiastic, I just like doing what I'm doing. I like the research, I like the surgery. I, uh, so I just ended up uh, here almost by chance. Passionate enthusiasm are absolutely mandatory if you're going to take on these kind of things because you're going to have to push it forward. We've spoken about a mentor. Um, sometimes mentors provide the seeds. That's the other thing to say. Sometimes mentors will come along and say, I've got a great idea, I don't have the time to do it. Can you lead on this and run, run with it? I think it's important to distinguish between something like that and something where you go for two or three years, you do a PhD or an MD in a unit, and then you leave, right? You are, you're working for somebody else's project. Now, that's fine, that's fine, but accept it for what it is. I, I think sometimes getting hold of that seed and, and getting it to grow is, um, is, is almost more valuable. Get some formal support at some point. And then my last point is to say that if you have that, or if you have most of that, if you've got the opportunity of carving out some time and if you can communicate that in the written format, you've got lots of various awards which you can apply for. And I would say that if you, can, if you have that and can communicate that, you would be very competitive. So that is all I want to say. Thank you very much.